Welcome to the Natural History Cupboard. Come on in. And welcome back to the Natural History Cupboard podcast, the place where the weird and wonderful parts of the natural world come together. I'm your host, Gareth, and with me as always is my co-host, Aaron. Say hi. Hello, guys. Hello. Hey, Hello. Guys, guys and guys. Yeah. Hello, all. Hello, everybody. Um, what have you been up to? Uh, a lot this week, actually. I've been... Uh, no exploding boilers. No, no. No touch, flooded touch, studios. Touch wood, yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, no. It's been a good week. It's been a very good week. So I took um, the, my partner and my daughter uh, camping. Cool. We went off to uh, Durdle Door. We actually camped in the campsite that's basically behind Durdle Door's car park. Ah, oh, it's nice up there. Yeah. yeah, it is. And that was fantastic. Um, I'll put up pictures and uh behind us um of of some of the stuff but yeah the, i mean i've never seen Durdle door in no? person no no you I've never... the Chesil beach whilst you're down there or uh no i didn't there was the Chesil beach was one of the places we wanted to go and also the swannery fossil forest as well okay we yeah, to yeah there. Not too far from there. but we we didn't we just didn't have time and and it was just a a break to relax and be together. That's my old haunt from when I used to. I was going to say we drove it. past your last. You yeah, were one of your previous. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was wonderful. At night, uh, I could hear a the tawny owl. It was right above our tent, so extremely loud, <laughs> but very, very cool to hear. But then, obviously, by the time you get out of your tent, he's blown off. Of course. Uh, so he's not there anymore. But but that was cool. Um, I did one night. You'll see the photo that I lay down outside the tent and um, I took a nice photo of the stars. Mm. So that was cool. Um, yeah. And then we ended up on our last day camping. We went off to Cork Castle. Nice. Which is a National Trust site and well worth going to. There was so much for families to do, so much for individuals to do. I've never really actually good. been there. In all the years that I lived down in Corset, I used to go past it if I was going to Swanage or anything like that. Mm. But no, I never stopped there. Well, uh, I see it nicely on the hill. You should definitely go there. Maybe we should make it a, a, mm. a covered trip out there because you've got a, quite a few fossil things around there. There's actually a fossil collection there as well, just down the road from Corf Castle. There's a fossil collection there. There's a quarry where they found a lot of fossils down that way. Is there really? I didn't yeah. know that. But I, I knew about Swanage. Obviously, I knew about the, the fossil beach. So that might be interesting then. Um, and there's other like kind of fossil beaches. It's not that far away from Barton on the Sea, where I was getting no, 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 you're a bit further along the, uh, the coast. coast. Yeah. Um, but but the main highlight of of Corfe Castle in in regards to the cupboard and in regards to passion for wildlife was um, the the lizards. Mm. Uh, I was going there hoping to find uh, sand lizards. Um, unfortunately, I didn't. I found, uh, but I did find. Ward lizards, which is the chaps that you see behind me, uh, one of which spent a good ten minutes with me, despite some um, some very noisy um, uh, visitors around around us when we were hanging out. I will say, however, in the in some of the visitors' um, uh, defence, is that there was one family uh, who had a couple of individuals who were frightened of lizards, and this lizard was right next to their leg, and I told them. I said, I'm really, I, I know, I know, but I told them, really sorry, but there's a lizard down there. He's, <laughs> he's going to disappear if you move. Do you mind if I just film the lizard for a second? I managed to get a minute of footage of this chap and loads of photos. And this family just very respectfully kept very quiet and let him hang out with me taking photos of him. So I've got some stunning shots of him Ooh. and uh, I was really happy. Uh, so that was over the moon with that so yeah and it's as you can see such a beautiful lizard yeah they are really pretty the thing that i think people tend to forget especially in the uk is yes we have lizards and yes we have snakes but most people tend to think that they're just rather drab looking things mm. but the patterning on those lizards on any of our species of lizards and snakes are really stunning when you look at like properly look at them mm. and not just go yeah brown green you know. Yeah, no, this is this is not that. I don't need to describe it because it's, no. it's come up. But I, I would say if the drabbest of our lizards is is the common lizard, and I wouldn't use the word drab for that. No, no, no. That's no. a beautiful lizard. So yeah, yeah. yeah um, so yeah, it's been it's been very good. And uh, today, my 
my little girl picked up um, some books, which I thought that she, she picked up some books from a local book exchange. No. One of which is Birds of the World, which looks like quite a cool uh, I book. I fossil one of that Have you years really? ago, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's got one of my favourites on it, Eclectuses. Mm. Yeah, I like Eclectuses. And a barley starling. And a barley starling. I used to work with a minor bird that had a, a, a personality, an identity crisis, because he kept saying, Hello, I'm a Barley Starling. I mean, that's a cheap way of getting. You are a mind getting around, mate. Yeah. You're gonna have to get over that. You are a mind. Um, uh, the other book is Falcons and Falconry, uh, which is looking like a bit of an older book, actually. But it is a nice book. So your daughter taking out Falconry? I, I think she, she might, might be. be. A, she might be a little young for it to do it. Like, can you imagine her like with a bold eagle on her arm as it flies off with it? She topple over. There's a Oh, a oh, yeah. uh, the Empress of the Skies. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, so uh, so this one is Falcon, Falcons and Falconry by Frank uh, Illingworth. Yeah, so yeah, kind of cool. Yeah, well, I don't think I've had as much of a lizardy week, but uh, I think now what have I done? Um, I've got a new plan. <laughs> I got What's given. I, I got given a um. A gift card for my, for my birthday for a garden center and i went right there's not really much i want i don't want the outdoor plants at the moment coming into winter so that would be a bad idea mm. uh i want a new desk plant from a from a new desk in the, in the new animal center and i like well I, I a couple of years back i got really taken by a begonia begonia maculata probably mm. pronounced the maculata a bit wrong but it's green leaves with red undersides with bright white, almost silvery dots all the way down each leaf. And I don't know, just it just really took me as a, an, a, an interesting plant. And I've got about three of them now that from the original plant, I've propagated a few of them. So I've got that on my desk. But looking through at other begonias, I was like, oh, these are really boring looking plants. I think I got the best one, you know, the, mm. the maculata. And then I saw another one that came up. It was Begonia ferox, um, which ferox, uh, for anyone well, when it comes to looking at any Latin name, is a thing that you will see at various different points on different animals. Ferox means ferocious or fierce. Mm, fierce. Um, and this one is, it is fierce. It's it's um, it it's also cool. known as uh, Begonia ferox troll. And it's mm. covered in these little spikes. Where the, the little dots on the other one are, this one's got these big spikes that stick up. They're not actually like, you know, going to rip you apart yeah, yeah. or anything, but they're really, really quite nice uh, to look at. So I, I bought that one the other day because it was the last one in the shop. I was like, oh, well, meant to be. I'll have that. And then there's, uh, there's only one other begonia that I've seen that I think is worth getting. And it's this uh, pavonia, pa kind of a pavonia, Begonia pavonia, which mm. is, uh, I showed you the picture before, and it's um, a begonia that through different shades of light, it goes from just being drab green right the way through to iridescent electric blue uh, under the right light. So I kind of want to find that yeah, one that, now. That photo is really nice. They, they come from, frankly, the, or naturally, they come from like riverbeds in Indonesia under like the the understory and everything mm. so they're they're sort of you'd probably come across them just by sort of going through dense undergrowth and shining a torch just to get through mm. but um yeah so I, i've now got a begonia ferox and a begonia maculata on my desk and uh, nice quite happy with that i also put a tiny little boba fett figurine on my uh, oh yeah on my computer screen as well so very good <laughs> make the office my own but is it is it is it Kid Boba Fett, or is it Boba Fett it's a, damaged it's, armor, or Boba Fett once he repaints his armor? It's Lego Boba Fett. Yeah, but which one? Must the be newest one. one. It so was... he's got the repaint, yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Very important question to ask. <laughs> i tell you what I forgot to mention, not to cut you off. And, and, uh, uh, we went um, paddleboarding last mm. night. Nice. Yeah, the, gla the, the glass. The glass, glass, the glass was like the sea. The sea was like a sheet of glass. And every now and then, you'd have these fish pop up, just nice. jump out of the water. I never managed to get a good enough look to be able to tell you what the species was. But yeah, uh, I went out with, with my partner, our daughter, and uh, my brother and his his son, my, my our nephew. Mm. Um, and it was just a 
really nice night. It was oh. a really, really nice night together. And like I say, it's always it a joy. Dark, to like, like, it was really dark quite early last yeah, night. Yeah, because the, the cloud cover was very thick. Yeah, it was humid as anything. The sea was warm. Yeah, it was humid and the sea was warm. Mm. Probably yeah. the best time for it. Yeah, really nice. So you can't get much wetter. So. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> right, well, should we... Uh, we shuffle on into our news then for the, this week. Yeah, because I was about to tell a bad with a joke. Well, oh, come on, yeah, just do it. <laughs> it's the news. Right, well, we're into this week's news. Aaron, what are we looking at? Well, every week, the weird and wonderful world of natural history offers up an embarrassment of riches when it comes to news and interesting topics. Uh, and though we here at the Natural History Covered are a small team, it's our aim to keep you guys, our fellow Covered dwellers, up to date on all the weird, wacky, wonderful, cool, funny and interesting and preferably good news that <laughs> we find. Um, so let's open up the Natural History Covered newsreel. And dive on into some of the more interesting topics. You'll have to excuse me as well because I keep coughing and dry throat. Die over there in the corner. <laughs> right, Aaron. Um, well, for the, the first article this week, uh, have you ever fancied wandering around a museum naked? Never, actually. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not really it featured high on my list either. Uh, but for um, uh, one night only, <laughs> from BBC News Museum to host Naked uh, Night for Naturists. And that is the Dorset Museum, where, um, well, you've you've been down to Dorset. Do you did you fancy going into the museum in Dorchester? Uh, I didn't. I I didn't go. I didn't go in. Didn't go in. Didn't strip your clothes off. No, no I certainly didn't strip. Well, clothes off, on no. the seventeenth of September, uh, you could you could very much have that privilege if you want. For the the price of admission, uh, you also get a glass of wine, changing facilities, and a locker for your clothes. Whilst you wander around and uh, view the galleries privately uh, in, in your own skin, as it were. In your birthday suit. Yes. I mean, I don't exactly know whether that adds to the viewing um, pleasure of seeing a pliosaur skull. Uh, but there you have it. Well, there it is. There I it wish is. that was your main article because there's so much we could go into that. <laughs> but, uh, but we must move on because it's just a, a head, headline. So my first start comes to us from Yahoo News, and it's the news that rediscovery of uh, forgotten Tasmanian tiger photos. You're just picturing na naked sparks excitement. Viewing, <laughs> viewing of a museum now. Isn't it? It's just because I read the headline uh, just as you were finishing yours off and saw that sparks excitement. I'm sure, I'm <laughs> sure that evening will. Uh, it's not for us to, uh, to judge. So two long lost photographs of a phylacine specimen thought to have been taken around 1902, resurfaced in the dusty archives of an Australian museum. The photos may have been taken just moments after the animal had actually died. Um, interesting. And it, as, as basically because it can be seen posed in three different positions. But researchers hope the find may indicate that there are yet more undiscovered phylacine photos out there in the wider world. Uh, uh, and I really hope so, because, I mean... The London Zoo fire scene died in 1934? Oh, I can't it? remember. 1930s. Uh, and the last one in the world was so far. in the 1930s, wasn't it? Well, uh, yes, something like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm hoping, I, I do wonder if these people get in contact with, like, like maybe, like, zookeeping Facebook pages or something. I basically. would imagine if they're there. Uh, people would have probably come across those. By, I don't know. By I now. don't know because these ones were were lost. You don't know what's lying in in the dusty like drawers of of some zookeeper who's now in his like sixties, eighties, may have even passed away. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Oh, one thing you can be sure of, Forrest Galante will be saying that that's proof. They're there. Uh, they're there. Uh, they're hidden. Yeah. <laughs> some sign news. Uh, new abelosaurid dinosaur discovered in France. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a late Cretaceous uh, species of abelosaurid uh, that has been found in Normandy, um, which, um, well, Normandy is, is just over the channel. So mm -hmm. there's the potential for this to possibly be an animal that may have lived in the UK as yeah, well, yeah. Um, depending on the exact geography of 
everything at that particular point. But it's been named uh, Calata Draco Cotard, uh, Cotardi, um, and it lived about 100 million years ago in what is now Normandy. Cat it very cool. I'd, I'd love to film this, and I bet I saw it over here as well. Uh, so my next article comes to us from Popular Science, uh, and the headline reads, Dinosaur footprints from Africa and South America are a match, uh, which is really, really cool and interesting to think about. Uh, so Brazil and Cameroon, situated in South America and Africa respectively, may be about 3,700 miles away from each other, but 120 million years ago, they were connected mm-hmm. and formed part of the supercontinent known as Gondwana. Um, more than 260 footprints represent the terrestrial theropods, sauropods and ornithischians uh, who could once traverse between what we now experience as two separate continents separated by an ocean, of course. But to think that you've got evidence of the same dinosaur individuals walking and it's been split and you can find like the two halves of the yeah, head yeah. on the track is just incredible. That is that is pretty amazing, actually. Um, so my uh, final short article uh, is from BBC News again, and um, it's Handler Attacked by Tiger at Australian Theme Park. Now, before I even looked into this article, I knew exactly where it was going to be, mm-hmm. uh, and that is at Dreamworld in Queensland, um, mostly because it's one of the only places where they have a lot of these tiger attraction things. Um, and it always just seemed a little... Little yeah. sus in some ways. Um, but a trained tiger handler has been hospitalised with injuries to her arm after being attacked by one of the animals at the Australian theme park. I mean, first off, you know, being hospitalised with just cuts and scratches as it's been uh, put on her arm uh, is getting away lightly, yeah, considering a tiger could so. more than easily kill you very quickly. Kill you enough for it. Yes. So um, there's a bit of a quote here as well. She was quite a, the the tiger trainer who was in her forties. Um, said she was quite. They said uh, when they the ambulance crews got there, uh, she said she was feeling quite pale and unwell, but in a general well uh, and stable condition, was able to be transported to the nearest district hospital um, after uh, the incident. So they're not exactly sure what led to this incident. Um, but they're what going to other it. than like free contact with tigers. I mean. I'd, I'd say that's probably got something to do with it. I, I don't mean to, again, I don't mean to like, I don't mean to sound cold or heartless. I I, I, I do genuinely wish her a fast recovery. Yeah. But, um, I, yeah, just, you know, free contact with big cats is not something we should be aspiring to. No. no, no. Um, and I believe Australia Zoo was doing that at one point. I think they were. There. Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if they still are or whether they weren't, but yeah, it's not, it's, it's a practice that doesn't need to happen, you know. It doesn't prove anything, doesn't make you any better at dealing with them, being, you know, being one side of a fence than the other. If anything, you can, I think you can, uh, you can prove that you can achieve more just by asking the animal to do something and it doing it for you through proper training yeah. than um, being in there and trying to not domineer, because there's no way you're going to domineer a tiger. No, and, um, and I don't... But trying think... to coerce it to do something. What I've seen on like the internet, on YouTube and stuff, is the Australians have a slightly different approach to the Americans. Whereas the Americans, not not all Americans and not all Australians, but a lot of the free contact I see in 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 American roadside zoos has been very much beating, kind of dominance yeah. type of thing. Whereas the ones in Australia are more like almost treating it like a kitten or a baby. Yeah, it's taken away from from. From mum and hand reared, and it's kept on like even as adults. I've seen adults being bottle fed milk, and you know, um, I think the different approaches equally not. I think more will come out about it um, in, the, in the coming weeks. Undoubtedly, we'll probably look at it again. Again, another headline we could go on for ages about. Yeah. But moving on, my next headline is again from BBC News, and it's worst grouse season for thirty years. Oh, it's business sh- shocks. Uh, <laughs> I love because I knew what your reaction would be, and I can I can hear <laughs> I can hear future Drew if he, if he listens to this, like s- singing about this. So the red grouse is a species endemic to the UK, but it is also a species at the heart of ongoing controversy. In a corruption of the term, rural elements have claimed that the management 
of the animal should be considered conservation. <laughs> uh, however, their very means of doing so and the ultimate mission of doing so are both pretty sinister. We have nature. to conserve it by blowing it out of the air and killing everything else off. Yeah. Heather, in which the grouse lives, is routinely burned to make space for more of the birds to wander and predators to be eradicated in order to basically assure the longevity um, for the species survival, right? Mm. Wrong! <laughs> this is all done so that people uh, with nasty hobbies can blow them out of the sky to get their jollies, and now, well, there just isn't that many. And the people uh, currently bemoaning the shortage are the businesses who oh. make their money off of the grouse shoots. So, you know, jog on. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bird that is definitely worth conserving. Um, yeah. Um, like I say, it's endemic to the UK. Um, uh, Drew helped me fill in a few gaps on red grouse, actually. Um, you know, my favourite thing about red grouse is... What's that? It's the, uh, the logo for um, uh, oh, famous, grouse. Was, famous grouse. Famous <laughs> grouse, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, it's also a bird that doesn't need this, uh, to be pseudo-conserved for the bloodlust of a minority. Yeah. Perhaps some better protection could achieve that same goal. And that just about wraps it up for this week's installment of the Natural History Covered Newsreel. It's been a bit of a wild one, I think, this week. <laughs> uh, remember, if you guys have uh, news or interesting articles at home that you think we should cover here, or in our main topic discussion, send them in. You can use any of the ways and means that you usually do to contact us, um, or you can do something odd, like... Uh, Stick it on the side of a bottle of famous grass whiskey and post it to you. Yeah, or go back or go back in time and send a load of dinosaurs across a land bridge that isn't there anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and hope that they just end up in the right place. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but with that said, the main topic discussion is is a, is a really interesting one, I think, and that's with Gareth today. Mm. So, Gareth, take it away. So, this came to my attention uh, actually uh, about a day or so ago, mm. and it was because of a uh, sort of um, petition that's going around to try and help uh, legally to try and stop this this particular wrong, as it were, from happening. Uh, and that was by it's the Juice Media. Uh, they do a lot of very good satirical ads, uh, like basically like government style ads, right? Uh, but being honest. So if if the government was being <laughs> honest. You've probably seen a few videos. Of them. Yeah, well, yes, I know what, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. Which it's an Australian group. Yeah, it, and they've it's done really good. They've done one recently about this particular incident as well. Right, and there is a um, as a campaign and a and a link on their their web uh, on their YouTube um, video itself to um, to the actual uh, petition to stop what is about to happen, and mm. that is. Uh, sea Shepherd founder Paul Watson uh, possibly being sent or extradited to Japan. Now, um, Sea Shepherd might be something you might be aware of, uh, and um, Paul Watson may be someone who you are aware of mm. as well. Sea Shepherd is basically an organization that was set up to stop whaling, was, essentially. Yeah. Um, actually take action. Yeah. Against it. So the way that Sea Shepherd worked uh, was to basically aggressively get in the way of whaling vessels in the Southern Ocean, where it is illegal to whale. And countries like Japan have been doing it for years. Um, and they they used various different tactics from uh, like stink bombs and, and all sorts of um, non-lethal, but aggressive negotiation, aggressive uh, methods. But. I, I, there, there is a quote that I'll actually start the whole thing off with, Paul Watson himself, about his tactics that he uses. In 1974, my objective was to eradicate whaling, and I hope to do that before I die. Uh, but he's insisted uh, that he is not a protest organisation, and I think that's fairly obvious by their actions. Mm -hmm. They're not protesting they are trying to do stuff. Uh, his, his reaction to that question was, we're an enforcement organisation. Ensuring that the seas are protected uh, and rejecting the label of eco terrorist sometimes stuck on me. I do aggressive, non violent interference, aggressive negotiations, yeah, uh, to use it in the Jedi term. Uh, there is 
Uh, there is no contradiction between aggressive and non-violence. Uh, right. It means that I will try and get the knife away from the person trying to kill a whale, but I won't hurt them. I don't cross that line. I've never hurt anyone, he says. So, basically, they, they will do rather extreme methods to stop Japanese whaling fleets, and they've done some really good... Um, they use reasonable force. Yeah, campaigns to, to basically do this. And there was a... a I'd say short-lived. I don't remember it being on for massively amount of time um, on Discovery Channel. When Discovery yeah. Channel used to be... Respectful? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when it used to be good. A long time ago, um, about about their, their plight, basically, and what they were doing. Mm. And it was what brought it to my attention at, at that time. I don't know whether you... Aware of it, yeah. No, I, the, no, the, the, the show did bring it to my attention. Probably. Yeah, it actually made way, me want to do it. And I was like, Yeah, I'd so. love to go and do that. And then it's like, Okay, so you've got to have a skill on a boat. Yeah, I've got no skills on a boat. I could spot whales, I could do that. I could, yeah. uh, that's that's a blue whale over there, but that's about it. Yeah, no. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't know what I could do on a boat really. Either. It's also like you could be a cook, it's like. Yeah, but there's probably people who are better cooks than me. I can do pancakes. <laughs> as, as the ship tosses one way, yeah. the pancake goes that way. Flat into wow. the wall. Especially oh, again, everyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, essentially, what are, we, what are we leading to? Well, uh, he is possibly to be extradited to, to Japan. And that is because he was um, brought in... Uh, it, it, sorry, he was taken into detention in Greenland of all places, you mm -hmm. know, that place that is very close to Japan, except it's not, um, under an international arrest warrant put out by Japan. Mm -hmm. Now, Greenland um, is a Danish territory, for those of you who are unaware, um, and they also take part in whaling. whaling. Um, islands. And the, yeah, the Faroe Islands as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and currently he is sitting in um, Nook Prison. Uh, right which he also points out in this, this Guardian article that he's been sat there looking out the window, watching the icebergs and whales go by. So, I mean, it doesn't sound like the worst prison in the world if you get to sit there and watch. Um, well, it's probably a very cold prison, I'd imagine. But he's basically uh, there at the moment. Uh, on the 4th of this month, uh, so by the time this ep episode comes out, we'll be past that point, we'll know whether... He is going to be sentenced, uh, sent to Japan, where unfortunately, well, their um, judicial system is not exactly great. It's been described mm -hmm. as medieval, uh, and there's something like a 99% conviction rate on people, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't tell me that it's a particularly good system. Yeah. You know, not saying that every person uh, should be walking free, because they certainly shouldn't, but a healthy system of um judges and, and and you know judicial uh oversight would show that not everyone is guilty not everyone is uh 100 you know that there should be much lower numbers than that but still within reason if you get what i mean yeah uh even more ridiculous um this is all come from him getting in the way of a japanese whaling vessel and uh, supposedly a rogue stink bomb hurt a Japanese sailor and essentially um, he's, he's stated that uh, the sentence if it was carried out in Denmark would be a 1,500 kroner fine which is roughly $223 yeah um, not exactly end of the world situation for that uh, but if he was taken to Japan he's likely to be sentenced to 15 years in jail which is insane. And essentially, the Japanese government seemed to have a vendetta against him for the various obvious reason of them being called out on the hypocrisy that is whale hunting, uh, a practice that, let's face it, we don't really need to be doing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I, would, uh, uh, I would urge, I know we have some Japanese listeners or viewers, if you are watching in japan or greenland even or denmark yeah yeah um please let us know you know do, do you uh do you agree with with a the sentence or you know what's trying to happen to to him b let us know if um 
if you've ever even actually eaten whale trout, it seems that a lot of the information that we certainly have is that most people in, in these places like Japan, Denmark, Greenland, wherever, they're not eating whale. No. It seems to be a bit like shark fin soup in that it's this sort of upper class thing to just base. It, it's a bit like grouse shooting. Yeah. It is purely done to keep some sort of bizarre tradition alive when we have much more sustainable things to eat than whale, you know. And the, the difference being grouse, those red grouse are not endangered. Whales, very much more endangered. Yeah, and um, the benefits of the ecosystem of a whale is massive because their poo fertilizes the ocean yeah. and and helps plankton blooms and and keeps the place going. Whale falls obviously you know feed species deep down in the ocean. Yeah, yeah they do. Their carbon sinks in themselves as well because they're a huge animal that takes in a lot of uh, food and, and locks it within their body. They live for a very long time as well. Yeah. So it keeps it trapped in uh, that carbon trapped away. And also they're one of the, or they are the largest animals on the planet. Yeah. They're larger than dinosaurs. And the, we're finally getting to a point where whales are starting to reappear in places that, you know, we hunted them to extinction in the UK, for instance. We're getting blue whales in yeah. the UK again. Um, we're seeing more orcas in the south, south of the UK. Uh, humpbacks as well. Yeah. Um, um, Agriculture is not yeah. perfect because farming of cattle, sheep, pigs, chickens produces an awful lot of greenhouse gases and does an awful lot of damage to the environment around the world. But if we can stop practices that are there purely just because they're being propped up by people in power to basically just exist, mm. that's at least a step in the right direction. And people like uh, people like him aren't doing that now. Yeah. Whether you agree with his tactics or not, whether you think it should be done less in your face and more from a political standpoint, that's fine. You know, some people want to do the the stand in front of the truck. Some people want to legislate that the truck doesn't come down the road. You know, yeah. Um, as long as no one's getting injured, yeah. And even then, because a lot of the time, these the sailors on these Japanese boats are literally just taking jobs, yeah, to support their families. It's very much like the poachers in Africa, yeah, yeah. Um, that doesn't make the action any less demonic, um, and horrendous. It, it is demonic and horrendous. Mm -hmm. But what I also are just trying to keep uh, a, a roof over their families and food on the table for their families. Well, they're not yes. even eating the whale. No, uh, they're not. That's it. They won't be doing that. Yeah. They will just be working on those ships. Yeah, the people who, who, who are in charge of this, the, the organisation behind the whaling that are yeah. from. And I've got to say, the only way to stop them is to disable their ships. So, yeah. Uh, the, 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 approach, the soft approach that everyone else has taken all this time beforehand and whilst Sea Shepherd have been in operation, people have been trying the softly, softly approach. Mm. And it's not working. They're still going out there. They were even going out there when they when they actually put sanctions on them. Yeah. They were still going out there and doing it. I think so, one of his sort of more famous quotes is they said, if I'm, a, if I'm committing piracy, I may as well commit piracy. Mm. You know? Um, but I, I, the biggest issue I have with it, and I remember from watching that TV program, which was on when when I was living in Australia, is they're operating in Australian waters. Yeah. You Did you ever watch Border Force? Uh, yes, I, <laughs> I saw a few episodes of that. Oh, nothing to declare, the, the, the Australian one, where it's the airport, um, and you've got people coming in, you get people bringing in like half a truckload of chicken, because apparently they don't think there's mm. chicken for sale in Australia. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Various episodes that you would see um, the... The Australian Navy mm. and Coast Guard and everything enforcing people fishing for abalone and for shark fin from Indonesia in Australian waters. And they'd be on these quite junky sort of ships made out of little wood and everything. And you'd see these Australian frigates and destroyers basically hunting these boats down mm. and, and arresting everyone, bringing them in. And I always thought there's a definite disparity between that happening in the Northern Territory for 
people who are quite poor, and they were breaking the law. They were breaking Australian yeah, yeah. international law. Uh, sorry, Australian uh, maritime law. And yet in the southern ocean of Australia, you've got Japanese whaling boats on a commercial level out there fishing, well, you know, hunting whales down. Yeah, yeah. And the Australian da- Navy does nothing. It's, it's I always all... find that absolutely... Well, it was because... Money. Oh, I was going to say politic and then money, yeah. And it's all greed, isn't it? And the other... Freedom power. No one's perfect, but at the same time, we could be making a small difference by ending an archaic practice mm. to make a big difference for the planet. Well, that's the other thing. We are we are trying to end things like fox hunting, mm. both the public and trying to say something good about the government. Um, there are members of the government... That, yeah. that do want to stop. That, that's why we got the ban for it, because yeah. there's interest in the government to, to do that. Uh, so at least we have people at all levels who are trying to make this change, even if even if that change is coming slowly. Whereas in Japan, like, yeah, the people don't eat it, uh, and I'm sure there are a lot of people against it, but the um, but there are obviously people at the top yeah. who, uh, who um, want it. Who want it. Um, but any of our any, any of our listeners who've had experience of living in Japan or living in Japan at the moment uh, or Greenland or Denmark or any of those sort of places where, or the Faroe Islands even, I don't mm. think we've got any, I've not seen any data saying the Faroe Islands. I don't know if it would show up as Faroe Islands or if it would show up Just as Denmark as, general. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, but please let us know. We'd be really intrigued to know more. And it, it's a debate I think we'd be quite happily look at in the, uh, in the future. So, I, do, yeah. I do just want to bring up one mm-hmm. thing uh, that Paul Watson is not in charge of SeaWorld anymore. He's in charge of you Paul Watson. Shepherd. What did I say? SeaWorld. SeaWorld. Sorry, yes. Yeah, <laughs> He's never SeaWorld been in would, charge of SeaWorld. would probably be a very different place if he was in charge. <laughs> uh, so he's not in charge of sea, sea Shepherd anymore. He's in charge of Paul Watson Foundation. Yeah. Um, so if you want to go and support him, go there, not the Sea Shepherd. I do hope, however, because Sea Shepherd, the board, basically removed him from his own uh, his own organisation because they wanted to go down the softly, softly social media approach and not take action. Whereas Paul, Captain Paul Watson, wanted to. The whole mission of Sea Shepherd is that they take direct action. They just, yeah. they're not keyboard warriors like a lot of other conservation organisations are. Um, they actually go out and do something about it. Uh, so he had to start up his whole, he got kicked out of his own organisation, had to set up his, his own new, new organisation from scratch, um, which is a shame on so many levels. But I think one, one of the biggest crimes is that he didn't get to keep that awesome logo. That is, oh, that is yeah. brand, that, that branding is, is brilliant. If, if you've not seen it, imagine the pirate skull and crossbones. The Jolly Roger. The Jolly Roger, yeah, but a little bit more kind of grotesquely detailed with a shepherd hook. And Poseidon's trident, and uh, that is just an awesome, awesome uh, design. Yeah. Uh, but they sh- they should feel ashamed that they uh, that that they kicked him out. But if they want some sort of redemption here, uh, I feel that they should be leading the charge to 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 turn this this decision around and, and save Paul Watson mm. from, uh, from it. Um, he's their he's their their founder. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Right. Well. Uh... Shall we move into our picture feature for this week? Yeah, let's do it. Ooh, Link's quite nice. It, it does actually, yeah. It's the creature feature. Right, well, we're into this week's creature feature. Aaron, what are we looking at? Uh, this week, covered dwellers, let's strap uh, back into our dry suits. Um, I don't think I've ever worn a dry suit. Have you not? No. I haven't either. Um, <laughs> Why are you saying it with that confidence? <laughs> well, we, get, we 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 should we should okay because they keep you nice and dry and warm far better than a wetsuit. Wet yeah, but obviously they were named with uh, clear intentions. <laughs> uh, we're also going to put on some dive gear. Okay, um, and we're going to descend into the frigid waters of the Arctic Ocean. Here, stretching from Hudson Bay in the Canadian East to just about reach in the beginnings of the coastline of, uh, of Eastern Russia, live around 170,000 members of a rather odd cetacean. Everybody knows how much I like cetaceans. Uh, and this 
one is no different. In fact, this animal's beauty kind of lies in that uh, oddity. Um, no other cetacean looks quite like this one. I'm talking, of course, about the Jedi of the sea, the narwhal. Uh, and now narwhals haven't always benefited from human intrigue, but they have always inspired a majestic sense of, of awe, I think, uh, from us. We look at them today as the underwater unicorn, <laughs> but in previous years, that hint of magic has come at a price. Mm. Uh, they've been hunted for their time. We've just been talking in the news about, about whaling. Um, now, narwhals won't be found in the in the areas where um, where yeah, exactly. Captain Paul Watson yeah. is. That's the other end of the globe. Uh, but they have suffered from from a whaling of sorts uh, specific to their kind. They've been hunted for their tusks. The narwhal has been used uh, basically as gifts between royal families um, and and amongst the kind of allied aristocracies across the across Eurasia, really. Um, and that's been going on for centuries, with prices fetching more than the equivalent weight of that tusk had it been made of gold. So that's a little bit mad. It is fair enough. Insane. Uh, it has been long held that it was actually the Vikings, um, or rather, I should say, the Norsemen, because the Viking to go Viking, it was a that's a job title. Yeah, it's not actually the race. Some people might be. Uh, yeah, to, to go Viking was essentially uh, the official job title of a pirate back in those days, mm -hmm. basically. Um, but yeah, it was basically for a long time, uh, people kind of agreed that it was the Norsemen um, who actually started or kick-started the trade in Narwhal uh, and their tusks uh, throughout Eurasia. But mm -hmm. there is actually no evidence for that. Yeah. They, they actually don't think that that's the case. It's highly unlikely. Regardless, the animal, minus the mystique, has long been a staple food source used by the Inuit peoples, um, and they tend to use every single part of it um, in some way or another. So, uh, for example, raw skin with blubber still attached is known as muktuk um, <laughs> and considered a delicacy to the tribes. And the skin itself is actually a rare Arctic source of, of vitamin C. Yeah. So uh, that that's uh, that's one of the ways that they can get. It's one of the only ways they can get that vitamin. It's the only way they're going to get pork scratching of some sort as well, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Um, traditional hunting involves the deployment of traditionally crafted uh, kayaks, um, with the Inuit hunters armed with harpoons. Incidentally, the tr traditional crafting of a kayak is actually like minus the whaling bit at the end. The crafting of a traditional kayak is actually a skill that I really, really like to learn. So yeah, if anyone listening knows how to do that, then please shout us out. On that. Right, I mean, cool. And we got our own sort of British Isles version, you know, the coracle. I don't know much about that, to be honest. To be completely honest with you, I don't. Have, I don't know much about that. It's like sitting in a soup bowl. Oh yeah, the round ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're traditionally sort of more Welsh than. Than anywhere else, but they, I, I would have thought around here on on um, on Exmoor, you, you oh, would really get so you would get those yeah. sort of things. I would imagine there's someone who would make a coracle around here. I'm going to look into that after mm. after we finish recording. But I've, it's a skill I've always wanted to have. I looked into it, and there's there is a place that will that will teach you how to make. Uh, I think it's canoes, like traditional canoes. Just makes me want to watch an old Ray Mears episode now. <laughs> It's up in Scotland, and I think it costs like just shy of two grand, which is a lot of money. Considering you've got to, you've got to get yourself up there and then transport it back with you to where yeah, you're going to bring the canoe back. So with you. yeah, it's, you uh, get to keep it. Yes, you do get to keep. I want to pay two grand and not get to keep it. No, I, I think personally, I think the fact that you get to keep it and the skill that you learn from doing it. Um, yeah. Among with other skills that you'd learn doing it, I think that would definitely be worth two grand. It's just money that I can't throw at something right now, really. Um, have to, you'll have to rename yourself Keir Dan. You know. Keir Dan. All oh, right, the ship, right. the ship from here. <laughs> um, but back to the Inuits, and uh, I just wanted to go over some of the traditional beliefs. By custom, up to two vertebrae should be set aside from the kill, uh, and they'll be used as basically to be turned into either tools mm. or art. So mm. two vertebrae by by ritual 
kept aside for tools and art. Um, and one last note on uh, Inuit Narwhal traditions. Gareth, do you know how they believe the Narwhal came into existence? I mean, I'm not particularly au okay fait with, with many of the uh, Inuit traditions. Um, I'm going to say it was a walrus that broke its tusk and there you go. And that's the other one got like bent out. That, that's not... A that's not, that's nowhere close to what it no, is. No, it's actually not. That's a really good. That, I could I could see someone I could see someone believe in that. Yeah. No, the actual the actual way that they believe that the Inuit came about was uh, one day whilst the the tribe are out hunting a tribe sorry are out hunting uh, whales. Um, someone threw a spear and it got stuck in its face. Exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. A huntswoman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a huntswoman. She threw the harpoon. It got stuck in the into it didn't get stuck into the face i don't think of, of the of the whale that she was hunting but it got stuck into the whale and it was still attached by the rope to her waist right she got dragged off the boat and through the water and and um basically as she's being dragged through the water um her hair twists and hardens um... into she she takes on a whale form like the whale she's hunting but her hair twists and forms into the horn in quotation yeah, marks yeah. Uh, because at that time they wouldn't have known what it actually is um so yeah that's that's they think that, that that's how that they thought that's how how they came about but for those of you who haven't seen such near mythic sea dwelling beasties let's go into what exactly a narwhal is uh what does it do and how does it hunt itself as uh, so we'll dive a little deeper so this is a stocky and stout cetacean. Uh, it's closely related to belugas, actually. Um, did you know that? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think it as much because they, they basically look very similar to each other. Yeah. So that yeah, so you get a vague grasp of the theme of what of the animal we're looking at. Just not as white as a beluga. Not as white. No. Now their swimming apparatus is somewhat unnoteworthy, to be honest. Uh, safe to say that they are tooled up with undersized flippers. Uh, their their flippers are very comically small that are curved upwards and a convex concave tail fluke depending on the right. steps. So it goes out and then up a little bit, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. But the actual general um shape depends is, is actually a, a trait of sexual dimorphism. Ah. So it, it depends on if they're male or female. And I don't think I actually go into this, but basically you'll discover in a minute that only one type of narwhal grows a tusk. tusk. Yeah. Uh, now that tusk has certain benefits, but it also has it also comes with some challenges in uh, in in light of basically water resistance as they're swimming through. Are you the trying sea. to tell me that something sticking out of your face is not very yeah. good for water resistance? Exactly what I'm trying to say. So, so actually, the the narwhals with the tusks have adapted to have a slightly differently shaped tail to yeah. the tusks, and we'll get onto who has what in a minute. But yeah, it's it's sexual dimorphism training. Mm. Uh, the body size can reach up to five point five meters and weigh as much as sixteen hundred kilograms. So that's eighteen foot and uh, thirty five hundred pounds for our friends across the pond. Uh, so smaller than the average popularly remarked on uh, whales. Yeah, um, it's pretty pretty small, but not tiny. Not tiny, no. It's still her. You'd know if one you. fell on you. Yeah. yeah, if one just dropped from the clouds, you'd, that'd be a bad <laughs> headache uh, and a bad back too, especially if it went nose down first. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's Gareth said that they're not as white as as their cousins the belugas, and that's true. It, they are mostly white, but they've got a marbling of kind of blackish brown markings. Although these actually fade with time, and the elders do become almost pure white. Ah, yeah. So, so they do end up that way, pretty much. But, um, but only very occasionally are they like you know like pure, pure, completely white yeah. specimens. But yeah, they do tend to fade and become more white as they get older. Um, and here we come to our first kind of noteworthy difference among uh, uh, their cetacean kin. The lack of a dorsal fin. Mm. So we're talking about the body, um, the, its size and its colour. Well, they actually don't have a dorsal fin on top. What they have instead 
is a dorsal ridge. So it runs along their spine. And it's thought that this is actually an adaptation that helps to kind of pull off the same effect, the same benefit as a dorsal fin. However, it, it means that they don't catch that fin on the bottom of the sea ice as they're swimming across oh, yeah. the surface there looking for sure. places to breathe. Yeah. So really cool adaptation there because that would be quite the hindrance. And, uh, Although it seems to be okay for orcas. Yeah, that's that's true. Which are like the most extreme dorsal fin in any whale, I think. Yes, they are. But I don't believe that they hang out for as long under pack ice as, no. as these guys do. Uh, another difference moving up the spine uh, can only really be seen when you're looking at a narwhal skeleton. Mm -hmm. Although you can observe it in action um, if you observe them for any number of time, uh, that is. And that's the neck vertebrae. So whilst they're kind of fused in other cetaceans or in most cetaceans, in uh, in in narwhals they're actually jointed, and so they've got a lot more flexibility and in the neck as well. and belugas as well. Yeah, and you can actually again that's river dolphins. See. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now moving up from the neck, a blunt snout ends with the most intriguing physical detail of the species, and that is quite obviously the tusk. Yeah. Now, as I say, only one type. Of uh, of narwhal has a tusk. Can you tell me which one? I would assume the males. It is the males. Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of obvious, but I thought I'd, I'd throw it out as a question just in case. I was just wondering whether it was going to be a trick question. Then it was going to no. Be... It's actually the very youngest female. Yes, but no, yeah. And as they get older, they drop them. Yeah. No, no. It's <laughs> it's only the males that have the tusks, and they're essentially kind of like nature's answer to jousting, although not really in in practice. They're actually a way too overgrown canine tooth uh, growing in the wrong direction. Wrong again in quotation marks. Uh, and they breach the left side of the of the upper lip um, and come basically spiraling outwards. Uh, some males even grow too. Yes, I have seen pictures of well, some of them with too. Yeah, if the if the right the right canine, I guess if it's not getting the right. I don't know, genetic signals or uh, hormone release or something. Or, yeah, uh, yeah, will grow out through the right side. Would you think, in the fact that there is symmetry in animals, mm. you would think having two would be far more the norm as opposed to one? Mm. But that's even less hydrodynamic. Than, I was going to say that <laughs> there would be evolutionary reasons why not, and that would be my top guess there. Yeah. Uh, now this eruption of the tooth it actually happens around the age of two, three years old. Uh, and it grows perpetually throughout the individual's life, lifetime, reaching lengths of nearly 10 foot, um, but being surprisingly light on account of the fact that they're hollow. Mm. Did you know that they're hollow? Didn't know they were hollow, no. They're hollow. Uh, so, Gareth, what do you reckon? I, I kind of joked and said that they, they're like nature's answer to jousting, but not really. Do you actually know like what the use of this dental spear is? This, this, kick butt facial horn is <laughs> uh, i would assume it's for one of two things mm -hmm. now my instant thought would be that it's for some sort of uh jousting-esque match but i think that's wrong if i remember correctly i think it might be a, a way of clearing pack ice as it starts to freeze mm -hmm. so that they can open up holes for breathing mm -hmm. am i right yeah or wrong or... actually to be honest the actual answer is hotly debated. Oh, it's well, still yeah. not really cemented. Potential weapon, potential tool. Um, we've observed elements of both, to be honest. But what is clear is that it definitely serves the dual purposes of being a sensory organ loaded to the max with nerve endings. And yeah, it's hollow. It's hollow, yeah. Hmm. But through it, they can uh, they can tell things about their environment, such as like. Uh, drops or increases in temperature gradient and such like that. So, so it, it helps inform them of where they where they are and where they want to be. I suppose if you ever drink a really cold oh, thing yeah. and you get you, you oh, know some dirty teeth. teeth. Oh, oh, imagine if you had like yeah, one it's sticking out sensitive tooth. It's sticking out in freezing cold water. Oh. <laughs> imagine that coupled with the brain freeze you experience from a Tango ice blast. <laughs> Other slush drinks are available when they're sponsored by Tango ice blast. But you can uh, if you want. Yeah, I, we got caught up there and I forgot to actually mention the secondary uh, purpose, the second purpose of, of the tusk, which is as a secondary sexual characteristic uh, comparable to the plumage of many birds. Yeah, I think peacock. Um, 
basically a healthy narwhal of a healthy tusk is is a sign of a of a good breeder for for a female. Yeah, because it takes a lot of extra effort to carry around that excess. Uh, you know, on top of what you're doing, so yeah, yeah you've got to be healthy. You've got to be strong. Which means genetically, that. you're going to be able to pass that on. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's that's the two kind of mm, the two purposes for which there is a consensus to, but there is still a hot debate about other purposes it might have. Uh, as a tool, for example, males have actually been observed swinging them with such colossal strength uh, through the water. That as it, that they basically slap them, uh, slap the, their prey, slap their prey into a stupor, um, <laughs> rendering them easy pickings, uh, basically. And uh, whilst we're on the topic of diet, what do you think that they are turning into fish kebabs? Well, to be honest, I wasn't actually sure on their diet, but now I'm going to guess fish like cod or pollock or something okay. like that. Yeah, well, they're actually very picky eaters. Of course they are. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's evidence of Arctic cod. So oh, there's your cod. There you go. Uh, Boreo Atlantic armhook squid, capelin, uh, Greenland halibut, polar cod, redfish, and wolffish being consumed. We found them. Bit, I've, we've either observed them hunting them, or we found dead ones with 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 stomach oh. contents evidence in this. Uh, so yeah, very picky eaters. Um, now, also the What's interesting is that the bottom dwelling species of, of those prey items, yeah, they tend to be fed on uh, during the winter, whereas the more active spe species are hunted through the summer, which kind of makes yeah, sense. Kind of makes sense. The, you, the food, it's colder, your energy is low, so the food you go for the easier food, yeah. and then when you, you've got that warmth, uh, you've got that energy, there's more active prey that are going to give you more energy to keep going. You fill up on that because times are going to be hard in the winter. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, back, back to kind of prey and, and hunting. It's thought that after the initial bump of that tusk, prey items are basically hoovered up by the, uh, by the sucking action. And in fact, um, it's not something that I'm going to cover in great detail, but their teeth are actually vestigial. Mm. not really of any use so we just sort of like sperm whales in that they just sort of uh <laughs> they only have limited amounts of teeth yeah they don't really use them because it's in sperm whales it's only the males and they use those just for fighting and yeah. it's just on their bottom jaw yeah that's right yeah yeah um so yeah the hunting is probably done as a group activity um as uh, because they're somewhat gregarious uh, especially in the summer when pods of which are normally around 20 loosely 20 individuals hanging out together again loosely through the winter they kind of merge and form ag aggregations that can build up to about a thousand individuals Quite so a that's a lot of as i say underwater jedi unicorns sort of potential to be accidentally poked in the <laughs> side it's a lot of, a lot of holes <laughs> yeah it all <laughs> goes wrong yeah so speaking of their social nature, the breeding season appears to start in the earlier half of the year, with courtship and eventually breeding being observed from March all the way through to May. Groups are thought to be kind of harem-like, with a with a harem-like, sorry, with a with a kind of dominant male and a group of females, um, and the females are reproductive from the age of six, whereas the males are actually uh, sexually mature from the age of twelve. Mm. It takes them twice as long to reach sexual maturity. Now, rutting has been observed in an activity known as tusking, but whether this is actually true rutting is a que uh, another question altogether, because they don't appear to actually be wrestling each other. They actually appear to be grooming each other. I wanted to see what your reaction would be to that. So I'm just picturing a tiny little brush on the end, or like a tiny yeah. comb on the end now. So what they, so basically what they think is going on here is that the, the, the males are rubbing the horns together mm -hmm. to remove encrustations ah. in, uh, from, from each other's tusks. It, it's a bit unclear, but uh, yeah, that's what that's what they think they're actually doing is actually cleaning each other's tusks to put on a better display, like help each other out, put mm -hmm. on a better display. Now, after successfully mating, a fifteen-month gestation commences, resulting in a single calf uh, dependent on being nursed by its mother. The longevity of that calf is a matter that hinges on several factors. 
all being well, uh, low end estimates estimate a life expectancy of about 50 years. But at other theories are a bit more generous, suggesting about 70 to 120 years, mm -hmm. depending on whether the individual is male or female. Yeah. Yeah. Now, for an animal surviving on the icy ledge, death is but one wrong move away. Uh, late migrations in, uh, in uh, will result in um, in mass suffocation. Yeah. Because if they leave a little bit late, uh, uh, the sea ice forms over the animals as they travel. They do. They get trapped. That, that pack ice forms over them, and it's far too hard for them, far too thick for them to break. The, well, the tusk that you're talking about. That sounds a horrific way to go. Imagine that being trapped under ice, no. running out of oxygen, and no, then get that. <laughs> the panic that they must feel. And that's why I find it utterly bizarre when you see those videos of people who go diving under ice. It's like, that's why. Oh, there's why things that that I've it's always like, thought. You know, I'd love to try it, but I won't. That kind of thing. What the fear of? I'm fairly certain the holes around here somewhere. Um, yeah, see, that's that's what I don't want. That's what I don't want. That I like the idea of like swimming from one hole to the other. Just in a, you tried it in like liquid water, right? Yeah. Where yeah. you can just go down at any point and come up at any, at any point. point. Yeah. That's really good. You know, <laughs> you could even do it in cold water if you want. Yeah. It's, it's more it's, when it's a solid. That's when it becomes an issue. It's it's more of a a desire to challenge the limits of, of your of, 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 of one's ability but nah. at the same time <laughs> i think that's a challenge too far because yeah, i nah. i'd be absolutely terrified you'd have to have like you'd have to have a heart for me to do it i'd have to have a harness this is gonna make you sound like such a coward uh, no, but no, I'd have no. a harness it's, attached it's an to overwhelming the need to survive <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's I not being a it. coward that's just being sensible i wouldn't do it for you Free, like free diving that's that's too much for me um yeah back to their migration um so basically their breathing opportunities can be separated by more than 1450 meters so Jeez. so that hole um basically need needs to be at least 0 0.5 meters wide to be usable so if the pack ice is frozen like if if it's already freezing thick by the time they've started to migrate, mm. the chances of being able to break the ice become slimmer, and the chances of being able to able to hold your breath to the next oh, potential yeah. hole become even slimmer. So it really is a a dash for survival, um, and not one that ends well if they leave mm. late. So this is actually known as sea ice entrapment and it can occasionally cause the narwhal to actually die of starvation before it dies of drowning because because the 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 desire the the, the requirement to find oxygen overrides your desire to go hunting and feed well yeah obviously yeah um so yeah it takes precedence and so they end up starving before they've before they've even got to the point of drowning to add further complications to this gauntlet Polar bears are known to to basically hang out at at brief narwhal brief holes, waiting for them to turn up, so that they can predate on them themselves. An so easy get, meal, yeah, well, heavy but easy meal. Heavy but easy, especially when w w the narwhal in question is starved of food and air. Yeah, um, and it's energy as though. So yeah, not not great. And then on top of that, you have the orcas to contend with. <laughs> so it really is a, a, a gauntlet. It's a winter wonderland. Out that's terrifying in every single aspect. What's the what's the word the, the, the phrase? So the expression trapped between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, or um, oh, it's uh, out of the Tell out of the, the orcs and to the mouths of the wolves, or whatever Tolkien said. And right, it, beca it becomes. Out the front pan into yeah. the fire. Um, but yeah, basically the, the orca pods will basically encircle the uh the the narwhal pods and basically wait. Yeah, <laughs> they kill every and they will they'll they'll kill every member of the pod and to, to feed them to feed their pod. What yeah. lovely animals orcas are. <laughs> yeah, this, this moving on, if it all goes to plan, a timely departure 
and some luck avoiding predators, pods of narwhals could very well survive under the, the, the pack ice with 0.3% to 0.5% uh, access to open water. Mm. So literally no open water uh, and only breathing through those breathe holes periodically, which remember are about 1,450 meters between each other. Jeez. And they can survive that for four months from January to April. These animals might be seen as this mystical unicorn of the sea. And they might not be as, as like kind of taken seriously as your blue whales, your orcas mm. and other things. But these are hardcore animals that wow. to survive that is, is insane. This is a hard animal. And it will be dark as well. It will be very, very dark, especially at certain times of the year in their range where it will be yeah. dark for a long period of time. So, Gareth, I wanted to finish on a couple of quick questions. Uh, you know what a narwhal is, mm -hmm. uh, but do you know, actually know, what a narwhal is? Um, so, do you know what the name narwhal means and where it originates? I would imagine it's something... Inuit or northern, actually, well, is it going to be something like Toothwalker or something like that? No, uh, actually, although that's a really, really good, um, that's actually a really good guess. Uh, that because that I think that's what I would have gone with if I hadn't already known what it means. Okay, so narwhal it, it actually comes from the old Norse word narwhal, yeah, um, and that means corpse whale. Any okay. idea why that might be? Do they smell really bad? Do they smell really bad? No, it's partly due to their coloration. The, the motley and white. Oh, I suppose they look like a rock in bit rock yeah. yeah, okay. And partially due to their hilarious habit, I think, of when they want to chill out, they just float like a log, completely motionless on the, on the surface. Oh, okay. They just kind of chill there, sleep in at the surface, not a bother in the world until some Vikings come across and go, there's a bloated corpse <laughs> in the sea. <laughs> so yeah, that's where the word narwhal, narwhal comes from. But what about its scientific name? Do you know what it is? I have no idea, but I'd imagine it probably got Odo or... Yeah. Well, you, you've done very well already. To well, be honest. because there's, there's two reasons I know that. Yeah. If you remember we did the walrus, which is Odo Bonoba Day. Yeah, still a funny name to say. Which is tooth walking, uh, tooth walker or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Tooth walking horse, something like that. I can't remember now. Um, and if you remember the walking with dinosaurs or walking with sea monsters one, mm -hmm. uh, they had Odo Venosotops, which is okay. uh, the tooth walking whale, which was a kind of like a manatee looking thing that had one tusk longer than the other, but mm. facing backwards. So Odo to do with Odont and yeah. tooth. So I would imagine that's in there, but. I don't know, go on, what's the rest I, of it? I will say, Gareth's done very well there. Uh, it might be obvious because the task is a two, maybe, yeah. but but you've done very well there. So so the 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 name is Monodon Monoceros. Oh. Now that, one, go on. Monodon, so that'd be one tooth. Yeah. One, uh, one Ceros. I think he's gonna I think he's gonna get it. So we're gonna get time. Oh no. I thought you'd get it because of Triceratops. Yeah, well, that's what I was... It's tri... Uh, it's... Horn. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so... so one horn, horn, one face. Yeah, no, so... one, one tooth, one horn. One vision. <laughs> <laughs> one love. Yes. One life. <laughs> yeah. So its name is, is Monodon Monoceros, which translates uh, into one tooth, one horn. Um, and it's ancient Greek in, in origin. Um, yeah, again, another one that's just like a bit rubbish. A little bit, yeah. Just stop repeating yourself. <laughs> uh, and also, where's the horn? Uh, it's obviously well, because yeah. they thought it was a horn and then they realized it. But they covered the bases. One, yeah. one tooth, one just horn. Just in case, just in case. We'll <laughs> get too close to find out. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, last question, I think, because I think this one's one that's going to surprise a few people. What type of cetacean is. A narwhal. Um, well, it's an odontocete, so it's a toothed whale. Mm. 
to because I ask this because uh, it still surprises people when you tell them that an orca is a dolphin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A narwhal is a porpoise. Yeah, that yeah that tracks it does, doesn't it? Yeah. When when you when you actually when when you hear it, you're like, okay, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I mean, I went the next like the the more broader category. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so, yes, I could see them fitting there with belugas in in there being well, they'd probably be the largest porpoises. I think the uh, second largest because I think belugas are bigger than narwhals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, second largest porpoise, but definitely the most well armed porpoise. Which is kind of funny to think about because when I think of when I think of the cetacean family, the extant ones, I think of the whales, um, be them baleen or, or toothed. I mm. think of the whales as kind of like the the the, uh, the leviathans of the sea, the the the, the sea yeah. monsters. They're not monsters, but the sea monsters basically. I think of the dolphins as what they are. Uh, in small form, like almost like a you know like a Bulbasaur to 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 the whales Venusaur, yeah, like okay. Pokemon talk. And keeping with the Pokemon kind of theme here, I think the porpoises are the Pokemon of the whale family because they look so babyish and cartoonish and and like, is that why I mean, dolphins pick on them and just beat the heck out of them and kill them? But they're always kind of pint sized. They're always they don't have like the the impressive. Kind of dental or oral display. No, um, no, they're not very threatening. There is something very Pokemon about the porpoises, and then you come across a narwhal, which does it kind of tracks because it's like the third stage of evolution. Uh, again, yeah. it's final evolution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, that is pretty much narwhals in a nutshell for you guys. Um, I hope it's been enjoyable, and I hope that yeah, I hope it's been informative. I think you need to point out that uh, how many how many references did you get in there? I think in the end, hang on. If if, if you're I think all... in the end, I got four references to the Weeble and Bob song. <laughs> the first thing, this is completely sort of out of uh, context of, of what was happening. The first thing that I did when I walked in this evening and and said, "Aaron, we're, we're doing now, well, aren't we?" Yes. Uh, I think I just started quoting parts of that song to you, and I went, well, I'm assuming that's in there. So. But do you, I don't know if you saw this. I was, I was again, this is before the recording happened. This is when I was writing this one up. I, and days of the I was in a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a mood when I started writing this up. But talking about Narwhals, it just cheered me up as I went. But I texted um, Drew and, and Gareth in our little group chat, and I said the, I said that. I'm not feeling very motivated at the moment. This is all I've got written for the uh, for the narwhal creature feature, and it was the lyrics to Weeble and Bob's <laughs> narwhal song, so which is a great paste. song. Yeah, you should go on YouTube. Don't get the kid friendly version. Get the original Weeble and Bob narwhal song. That's I mean, it's proper like classic internet. I that is that's... that is that's from the people that, that brought you such classics as Badger, 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 oh. Badger, Badger, Mushroom, Mushroom. <laughs> Yeah, once you finish watching this, go and uh, go and track down those. Yeah, and Trogdor as well, yeah. the Burninator. Salad hands. <laughs> no salad, salad fingers. fingers. Sorry. <laughs> God. Anyway, right. Moving on. Should we go into our our emails? Let's get there. Yeah, let's let's get out of Weeble and Bob and into the emails. <laughs> Bing! You've got mail. Ooh, it's an email. Right, well, we're into this week's emails, uh, and we're going to start things off with our question from last week. It was, uh, what do you think should you, be your country's national fossil species? This is based on Stegosaurus being the uh, state fossil of... Oh, can you remember what state I, it was? I can't remember. No? How embarrassing. Uh, it was Colorado. Oh, right, OK. Interestingly enough, Aaron, uh, whilst doing a little bit of extra research, do you know what Utah's state fossil is? It's not a Utah raptor. No. It's, um, uh, so I've read this before. That's uh, because I posted uh, it uh, uh, earlier in the week. I didn't see if you were reading our posts. No. Um, <laughs> no so, not. interestingly enough, Utah is in a, an interesting position in that it has a state fossil, mm -hmm. Allosaurus, and a state dinosaur, Utah raptor. Yeah. Okay. So, interesting. It's got, it's, it's being greedy, basically. Yeah. And why not? They've got exactly. Them. So Louisa O'Leary started things off with mammoth. Uh, they've been found in all fifty states. Um, I think that's a fairly good shout for the US. 
Mm. I'm assuming, or we know Louise O'Leary is in is in the US. Yeah. Um, did you want to read your your reply? Uh, okay. Yeah. I just I just said that mammoth should be should be found in all countries everywhere. Well, except Australia, it, South it, America. No, I mean it should be Actually, just, just by it's a crime that it's not found in every single country. It's such a cool animal. It should be found in every single. So I said it should be found in all countries everywhere. I don't have a bias. Everyone else has a bias. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Danny Kevin has put, uh, I think England should be the Lloyds Bank Coprolite from Atlas Obscura. So we just had to pause there for a second yeah. um, to just double check uh, what that in fact was. Um, and, and it does not. It does not in any way disappoint. No, it doesn't. It, it is a, well, the reason why it's called the Lloyds Bank one. It sums up. Britain pretty well actually yeah I mean I think yeah. should be national fossil why not I love it yeah um so it is a paleo fossil or sorry uh, it is a uh, fossil of some human feces a particularly large <laughs> piece of human feces believed believed to have come from when the uh, the settlement of York was actually called Jorvik mm. uh, and was a Viking settlement North settlement, so uh, it was found under what was the um, the Lloyd's Bank in 1972. Yeah, and is is basically in the museum in in York, and uh, yeah, you can go and see a giant bike. <laughs> bike and, uh... <laughs> so somebody was uh, was very pleased one day, I think, with what they left behind. If they'd have if they'd have only known what they'd have left behind. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't a Viking, maybe it was a time traveler. <laughs> Fair enough. You want to do the next so one? The next one comes to uh, one of our Patreon supporters, uh, Nick to Nick, who we're not jealous of at all. No. We have to keep repeating. <laughs> and he thinks that his national fossil should be Phytocalea, obviously. Oh, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, to which I've, uh, I've said, obviously, we're not jealous at all. Australia. Good, uh, good species, that one. Yeah. And then Jen Babs, rounding it out, uh, said, uh, it's got to be Ichthyosaurus or Plesiosaur because of Mary Anning, uh, obviously. And then she's included uh, a link to um, uh, Dean Lomax uh, article uh, on the Natural History Museum website about the um, the Rutland uh, Ichthyosaur, the massive one that was discovered uh, last year, I think. It was last year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and... Below that, somebody has replied, uh, sorry, Claire Osborne has uh, seconded that and said, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we've got, um, we would have a competitor there. I think is it Ichthyosaur, Plesiosaur, or Giant Viking Boo uh, well, for England? Yeah. Well, I said last week that I would go Ichthyosaur for England because it's, um, because because of Mary Anna and given her, her, her. But now you've heard of the Viking Boo. Viking, yeah, and do you know what? It, like, I'm. No bias involved, but uh, it could have been any human poo. <laughs> fossilized or none. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the fact that it's a fossilized poo, it's it's had that impact. Uh, that's oh, quite funny. I would say it had certainly an, an amount of impact. Anyway, <laughs> moving on quickly. <laughs> this week's question uh, is: What animal would you add a horn to to make it cooler? Uh, we base this obviously on your your narwhal, uh, which I know is a tusk. But yeah. we're going with horn for simplicity. Which animal would you add a horn to to make it cooler? Mm -hmm. Maybe it, it's got to be an animal that doesn't have a horn. Maybe Obviously, it, it'd be it's too obvious to go with horse. And even if you went with horse, you have rhinos. Yeah, it's too obvious to go with like you know adding a horn to. Something that already has a horn, like again, like rhino or cows or something like that, uh, or, or or adding a horn to an orca because you've already got. You, know, you don't need to give them any more like advantages. No, I, I'm thinking of going completely obscure, like uh, maybe something like, you know, like maybe like a European bee to the world, or a griffin vulture, the horn. They're going to get it more griffin like. On its, on its like. Uh, <laughs> On his beak, like yeah, big, big old horn on his beak. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with that route. Yeah, it's yeah, not bad. I'm going to go with, with a bird. I'd like to see a European bee here with a horn or a, or a griffin vulture with a horn. 
I've got I've got two thoughts. Okay. Oh, I don't know. What about a lap at face photo of a horn? Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. Lap at cool. face photo. That's my that's my answer. So my two thoughts are tangling. Now mm. this could go one of two ways. If you put a horn on its nose to make it look even more dragon esque, uh, it would either it would either make people love it more mm. because tangling, why not? Or it would basically have people going after it like rhino horn, and the whole yeah. thing would be. 10 times worse. So that could be horrendous. <laughs> but my other thought would be platypus. Let's put a horn on there. Horn Why on not? Let's, add, yeah. let's put a hat on a hat. Let's go nuts. <laughs> horn on a platypus. Why not? That's actually a really good idea. It's just <laughs> like really mess with, with future paleontologists. Well, it's, it's more just a case of people found it such an outrageous ca uh, creature in the beginning. Let's make it more outrageous. We're going to go down that route. I'd stick a horn on its bill and give it antlers. Yeah, there really you go. Yeah, really make people go, what on earth? So you think there's a moose or something, a deer swimming through the water. This is it's actually a platypus. Yeah. Well, there you go. So you can uh, put that on our Facebook page um, as to what animal you think deserves a horn to make it cooler, um, which uh, will be covering next week and seeing what we'll people do. say. Um, but you can get in contact with us in a myriad of other ways. One way is through our emails, uh, which is the Nat History Covered at gmail.com. Uh, and in fact, Aaron has got a uh, email, that's the word, uh, yeah. for us. Um, so what have we got? Yeah, so we got an email from one of our lovely Patreon supporters. Um, and actually, Jen is, is one, of, one of the ones that interacts with us the most, actually. So, so thank you for that. So it comes to us from Jen Greenhall. And she says, hello, thought I'd drop you this pic of a blue penguin. Behind us, mm -hmm. from Manchester Museum. Went this morning. They have a pretty cool vivarium too, which has some windows do, actually, where you yeah. can see into the workroom with people cleaning tanks. Jurassic Park kind of vibe. <laughs> that kind of vibe. Yeah. Uh, Stan, the T Rex is still there too, which yes. has made me think. Hang on, I need to. I need to go because I've not. Manchester Museum's museum. really good. Um, worth a visit. Avoiding the small people by getting there early-ish. Hmm. It's, uh, it's definitely we'll, worth a trip. We will put all of... She has been nice enough to send a couple of photos and we'll put them as we yeah. would have seen them as we talked about them. Um, so there are uh, other ways you can get in contact with us, just like uh, Jen uh, Greenhall has done. Um, she is a Patreon. Uh, one of the, the ways that you can uh, get in contact with us and help to contribute to the podcast. Aaron, who are our Patreons? Yeah, so uh, as Gareth suggested, every week we like to... Give a little love back by shouting out the names of our wonderful Patreon supporters. Now, these are the people who have been kind enough to support us on a financial level. And uh, those people are, of course, Fogtober, uh, Jen Greenhall, Connie P, Chelsea McKee, uh, Nick Tinnick, and Justin Knight. Guys, your financial contributions are actively helping us out here in the cover to make the product better for all of us, uh, yourselves and ourselves included. And we really cannot thank you enough or tell you how grateful we are um yeah. so uh hopefully this is a little drop in the ocean of, of that mm -hmm. but uh no, we we do saying that we do actually appreciate all of our cover dwellers and the support that you guys give us by listening or watching uh, or both and also liking sharing subscribing um and reviewing us uh on the various mediums do so but if you feel we've earned it and you looking to join our patreon uh, uh, clan uh, or pack or pod in this week's case um you can do so by two tiers at the moment that's the animal ambassadors and the nature nerds uh, and you can find out more about that on the patreon website itself um but with that said once again just from the bottom of our hearts thank you very much for your support yeah, massive thank you from both of us mm. uh, and there are a myriad of other ways that you can get involved in the podcast uh, that don't require a financial contribution because money isn't everything. You can help us out in the most simplest way possible just by watching, uh, liking, subscribing, ringing a bell, pulling an icon, doing some sort of thing uh, on whatever platform you are consuming this content on, whether it's uh, audio or visual. Uh, telling a friend, that really helps out a massive amount and podcasts uh, live and die on the word of mouth. Um, so tell someone who you know. Tell a friend, tell an enemy, tell a narwhal as it pokes around with its exceedingly long tooth. Chase off all the polar bears. Tell tell the polar bears. Hey, tell the polar bears. Go listen to this podcast, <laughs> and then we'll go to listen to the podcast. And then you wait at the thing. 
the hole and when he pops up the breath go go watch the podcast and then he'll go off and, and yeah captive audience literally yeah, everybody <laughs> listens to the podcast <laughs> so yeah um you can help out uh, by doing that very simple thing but that pretty much brings us to the end of this week's episode so uh big thank you aaron thank you very much that's all right um, and a big thank you to you at home for listening uh, and we will see you next time here in the natural history cupboard bye One does not chase off Cthulhu without being the Jedi of the sea. I'm going to sing the whole thing now. It's <laughs> like Cthulhu eating you. I don't know if we can get demonetized for <laughs> <laughs>